Perfect. Um, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and to meet so many inspiring women from all areas of data science. Um, I think what sets my talk apart from some of the ones we've heard so far is that it's really coming from the application side, uh, at least as a starting point. And the application in this case is to inform public health policy making during a global and ongoing pandemic. Um, so the first thing that you really want to do when you start noticing an increase in infections somewhere, in this case in, in China, that rapidly spread around the world, is, is to figure out what's the current status of that uh, pandemic. Like, who is infecting whom? Where are they being infected? Uh, how many people are getting so sick with this disease that they end up in the hospital? Can we predict what kind of ICU capacity we need? And so on. And... Um, as epidemiologists, we talk about sort of three main indicators that are important to keep track of. It's the disease prevalence, so that's the people that are currently infected with the disease. It's some kind of cumulative measure until they've recovered. Then there's the incidence, that's the people newly infected with the disease each day. And there's changes to the incidence. So do we have ever more people infected every day? Is the pandemic increasing in size or is it rather decreasing? Um, I like to compare this to a PID controller where we need some proportional, integral and uh, derivative information on the current transmission processes uh, to be able to control also what kind of target value we want to reach. And this target value is in the hands of policymakers. So in New Zealand, for instance, they had this zero COVID strategy where the goal is zero transmissions. In Switzerland, the goal was a different one, rather that we didn't want to overburden the health system. Um, and we can achieve this control through interventions. My role in all of this was not to determine those interventions, but rather to uh, uh, supply the information necessary to do so, supply uh, information on the status of the pandemic, and specifically these changes to the incidence. So we study here the effective reproductive number, RE. You might have heard it. It was uh, in many newspapers all the time. Um, and it describes the average number of secondary infections caused by a primary infected individual. And it's an intuitive measure in the sense that if this is above one, each individual infects more people and the epidemic is growing, whereas if it's below one, uh, the epidemic is shrinking in size. As I said, we monitored um, this number first in Switzerland and then extended this to 170 countries around the world. We developed a pipeline to take the data from these different countries here. Now, after two years of pandemic, that's two years of time series data for these 170 countries and different sources of information also, both on the number of positive tests every day, but also people getting hospitalized with COVID or dying with the disease. Um, we developed a pipeline to estimate the effective reproductive number from this data and then also a dashboard, a shiny app um, to communicate uh, this data um, to the public and, and to policymakers. And as I mentioned in Switzerland, this uh, directly influenced public health policy, even leading to a sort of infamous moment around December 2020, where the opening and closing of certain establishments like restaurants was directly tied to uh, the estimates that we put out on our dashboard. More recently, um, these estimates were also used uh, when Omicron was first presented to the public, because outside of Switzerland, the primary country that's been using our estimates was South Africa, because we uh, integrated uh, information on different provinces in South Africa already relatively early on during the pandemic. So in the following, I briefly want to present sort of this pipeline that we have, give you some intuition for how we estimate the effective reproductive number, and on also the extension of this method to environmental data. So the core idea of our pipeline is to go from observed case incidents, that's the um, daily uh, numbers of people newly infected with the disease and go to an estimate of the effective reproductive number. And at the core, what we can use is that uh, infection incidence contains information on RE because uh, it's this quantity that describes how many uh, infections each single infection uh, creates in turn. <clears throat> 
The real problem here is that we cannot observe the infections directly. We only know with a certain delay that someone might have been infected in the past when they start showing symptoms, when they go and get tested, or even end up in the hospital with the disease. And so we need to use information on these delays to uh, create an estimate of the infection incidence in the first place. Um, we can get information on these delays using epidemiological data. So basically, people are asked, when did you first develop symptoms? When did you get your test results? This gives us information on this delay from symptom onset to observation. And we have additional information on the time from uh, infection to symptom onset um, from um, like controlled studies where we really know who infected whom. Then we use a deconvolution to uh, infer the time series of infection incidents uh, from this observed case incidence, and that's here this uh, drawn blue line. When we have that, we can use existing methods to estimate the effective reproductive number from the infection incidence. This was a problem that was already addressed during previous pandemics, sort of Ebola uh, and things like that. And um, this method, EpiEstim, is nice in the sense that it comes with an estimate of uncertainty uh, of how much we can say about the um, effective reproductive number from the infection incidence. But what it doesn't take into account is all of the uncertainty that comes from the observation process because that's not modeled within this, uh, this aspect. So that's why we added an additional step where we bootstrap the case incidence data um, using block bootstrap and basically repeat this process a whole bunch of times and, and create more realistic confidence intervals. Because uh, especially when uh, giving advice or trying to provide information that policymakers base their decisions on, it's really crucial to have a good estimate of the uncertainty. Maybe it's even more important than that your point estimate um, is, is exactly correct. Um, so this was an overview of the pipeline. I've showed you we can use different types of, of proxies for infections because all of these are somehow generated by people that were infected originally and then later um, are, are observed in some way, be it in the hospital or in the morgue. Sorry, that was macabre. Um, and uh, we, we now um, developed this as an, an R package and made it available to the public. The good thing about having these different proxies is that each of them is biased in a different way. So for instance, uh, when tests are hard to come by, um, people that end up in the hospital might be prioritized to be tested for whether they have COVID or not. So the hospitalization numbers are less biased than the testing numbers themselves. But all of these numbers are still collected within the healthcare system. So if we have a complete collapse of the healthcare system, um, like during the, the second wave, <laughs> we were pretty close to being completely overburdened, um, then all of these measures might be biased in a similar way. And that's where this idea of using environmental data comes in, because it's an independent proxy of what's going on. Already relatively early during the pandemic, uh, environmental engineers primarily um, found that uh, the virus SARS-CoV-2 could be detected in wastewater, and that if you measure these viral concentrations over multiple days and weeks, actually the uh, resulting measurements quite closely match uh, the infection incidence. And that's because every person that's infected with the virus, they will shed this virus into the wastewater in an inactivated form, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Uh, and basically when they go to the toilet, when they brush their teeth or, or whatever, and this then gives us a nice mapping sort of back to what this underlying um, transmission dynamics were. And when we learned this, we thought, okay, we should actually be able to estimate, again, this infection incidence from these wastewater data and use it to estimate an RE just based on this environmental data source. And really, the core question there is, how delayed is this wastewater signal now with respect to our uh, original infections? Um, in contrast to the um, case incidence data, where we have sort of a population level distribution of delays, each person takes X many days to get tested, we now have individual level distributions of shedding. So perhaps uh, five days after infection, you'll shed more virus into the wastewater than 10 days later, simply because your body is, is fighting the infection. And 
Um, this shedding load distribution can be measured, um, and it was measured in sort of clinical studies in different ways. Um, and we can use that information then to do our deconvolution in this case. Again, we care about the temporal dynamics now. We don't care about the absolute magnitude of shedding um, be because we need to, to scale all of these properties anyway. Um, and with that, we managed to estimate an RE from um, wastewater data. Um, we already showed that in a paper on data from Zurich and San Jose in, in the US. And since more than a year now, we also monitor this actively in um, six different locations, uh, wastewater treatment plants throughout Switzerland. This here is a um, picture of the dashboard we have um, to show that, developed by my master student, Taru Singhal, who is also here today. Um, and uh, we're planning to extend this to even more locations because now the um, um, Swiss uh, Bundesamt für Umwelt and whatever um, environmental um, things has uh, seen sort of the value of this data and extended this, this program to, I think, around 100 wastewater treatment plants throughout the country that are monitored uh, quite regularly for SARS-CoV-2. And then the idea is to also... Um, do that for other diseases in the future, um, where we hopefully can use these similar techniques to say something about the transmission dynamics. Um, so yeah, I have a little bit more time left than I, I thought I would, so I'll jump to... Sorry, <laughs> one extra bit that I wanted to show you is how we can also integrate genomic information on top of the rest of this framework. Um, so my colleagues um, in um, the computational evolution group have been really instrumental in uh, rolling out uh, a sequencing program um, of SARS-CoV-2 in Switzerland during the pandemic. So that started with uh, the no, like the the swabs that everyone takes um, to, to see whether they're positive or not. You can take the material from these swabs, sequence it, and determine, for instance, which variants um, the person was originally infected with. And um, more recently, now that we're doing more wastewater work, we've also started sequencing the wastewater and can similarly detect which variants are in the wastewater in which proportions. And um, yeah, you all know probably that over the last two years, actually, a lot of the, or no, the last year, a lot of the dynamics of transmission have been governed by these different variants. The um, introduction of variants that are more transmissible than previous ones or that can evade immunity. And so uh, actually keeping track of which variants are circulating in the population and which are increasing in frequency is really essential, again, to inform um, our, our public health policymakers. Um, yeah. And we've used this information to then also estimate uh, variant-specific effective reproductive numbers. So basically, uh, the trick is that if you have a proportion of um, all of your infections that corresponds to a particular variant and you have the number of infections on a given day, you can get estimates of variant-specific incidents and similarly apply this pipeline to get variant-specific effective reproductive numbers. And we use this uh, early 2021 to show that um, with the introduction of alpha in Switzerland, it was very likely that uh, even though at that time um, infections were decreasing, that in the near future it would start to increase once alpha um, would become more prominent. And that's, I, I'm sorry to say, part of the reason why then uh, the government decided to uh, implement the lockdown or at least extend and, and increase uh, intervention measures just to prevent that scenario uh, from happening. So with that, <laughs> I come to my conclusion um, that we've developed this pipeline to estimate the effective reproductive number. We've used it on a variety of different uh, observation sources, including wastewater, and this can then be used to study um, the effect of interventions uh, or of variants on transmission dynamics um, and also inform uh, the public health response to SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. <laughs>